Good morning, I'm Bill Humber and uh, welcome to another session of the Green Citizen Campaign at Seneca College. Today we're with Dr. Gail Kranzberg of McMaster University's Arcelor Middle DeFasco Center for Engineering and Public Policy. Gail, tell us a little bit about yourself and the Arcelor Mittel DeFasco <laughs> Center for Engineering and Public Policy. Oh, thank you so much, Bill. Uh, the center actually is the first of its kind in Canada and we train graduate students uh, on how to c come up with sustainable public policy, but we take engineers and scientists and train them to talk to policymakers and mm. learn about social sciences and economics and political science and so on. It really rounds them out and brings their technical skills to problem solving in the real world. Now, engineers are really good at building and designing things. Do you do you find it's a bit more challenged to introduce some of those social, economic, environmental concepts to them? And how do they take to that? Well, very good question. Um, the engineers, particularly the engineers in the course, um, want the formulas. Mm -hmm. What's the calculation? What's right? What's wrong? Mm -hmm. And it takes them a little while to understand that there's a lot of subtleties around policy, mm -hmm. that there's politics around policy, there's social equity, there's environmental protection, there's economic stability. and, and Many of them are in the program because they mm. want that. They want to contribute mm. better to society beyond what an engineer does. So it takes a bit of uh, it takes a bit of time and it takes a lot of uh, energy and a lot of reading. And they eventually get it. And when they mm. get it, you see the light bulbs go off and 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 they've want they've gotten wonderful jobs mm. as a consequence because industry, business, governments are looking for engineers who can talk about public policy, mm. and they're a very rare breed. Mm. Well, tell us, how, how, how did you come to McMaster? Uh, what, was, what was your career path that led to this, this wonderful opportunity now, now that, you, that you're able to direct? Well, to be honest, I never imagined myself at the university mm. at the beginning of my career. Um, I did my graduate work um, uh, in environmental toxicology. Mm -hmm. I looked at contaminated sediment, in mm -hmm. fact, and I was hired by the Ontario Ministry of the Environment to be a scientist. Mm and working on Great Lakes issues. Mm -hmm. And I got stung by the Great Lakes. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing you need to know is that I'm passionate about the Great Lakes. And I got the opportunity then to mm -hmm. become a senior policy advisor on mm -hmm. Great Lakes. So I had to learn on my own how as a scientist to communicate with policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, from there I went on to work with a binational organization, the International Joint Commission, whose existence of that particular office was because the Great Lakes were really mm -hmm. important and I directed that office for a while. And while I was there, mm. colleagues of mine from McMaster said, Gail, there's a program here that trains scientists and engineers about how to do policy. Mm. And that's sort of how my career went. Mm. I went from the scientist to become a policy advocate, policy maker, and uh, had the opportunity to train others to do that. And I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I just love it there. I love the mm. energy and the enthusiasm and with the youth around me, but also senior um, folks and gra um, uh, mature students, mm -hmm. everybody wanting to change their career to better society. Mm. And, uh, and some of them really focus on the Great Lakes too, which is a pleasure for me. Now, I want to talk about the Great Lakes, and, but I also want to talk about it in the context of the work that you did in Collingwood. So mm. maybe give us the big picture of the challenges facing the Great Lakes and how you were able to address at least one area of challenge on the Great Lakes in Collingwood. The Great Lakes uh, are perceived by people either as being this vast, untouchable water that's mm. pure and wonderful, or deep, dark, and dirty. Mm. So there's this sort of polarizing view. When you talk to people around Toronto about, will you swim in Lake Ontario? Mm. A lot of people say, no, 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 I can't swim in Lake Ontario. Well, in fact, our beaches are really quite good. Mm. Um, so the, but some of the real big problems facing the Great Lakes is excessive nutrient runoff from mm. agricultural fields, from fertilizers on people's lawns, for example, that create massive amounts of algae or slimy mm. green goo and, mm. and ca causes all sorts of problems on the nearshore environment. Um, we have toxic chemicals coming into the Great Lakes from the chemicals that you and I use, mm -hmm. maybe medication, pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. or cleaning products even. Mm -hmm. It's not just industry. Mm -hmm. um, there's species that come in from overseas that mm -hmm. are invasive, that just change the biodiversity of the Great Lakes, change food webs in the Great Lakes. Uh, there's a whole range of threats facing mm -hmm. the Great Lakes, and of course, habitat destruction everywhere mm -hmm. you go. So when I go from Mississauga, into Hamilton, I see what was farmer's fields, large subdevelopments. Mm -hmm. So no longer is that green space mm -hmm. for the water to percolate, but it's all paved over mm -hmm. and run off and 
nasty things go into the into the Great Lakes as well as destroying habitat. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's why we see coyotes in downtown Toronto. Mm -hmm. It's not because they want to be there. It's because we've gotten rid of their homes. So in the late 80s, sounds like a long time ago, mm -hmm. early 90s, I was given an opportunity to coordinate a, what's called a remedial action plan. Mm. What kinds of things could we do to bring back a particular place? And that place mm. happened to be Collingwood Harbor mm -hmm. on Georgian Bay. Mm -hmm. And if uh, some of your viewers know Collingwood, they see it's a it's beautiful location. Mm -hmm. It's right at Blue Mountain, right on the beautiful waters of Georgian Bay. But it had a long history of industry. Mm -hmm. Shipbuilding industry, contaminated sediment, uh, infill, mm -hmm. habitat destruction, a sewage treatment plant, discharging to a small harbor, nutrient enrichment, all those things were mm -hmm. happening there. And the experience in Collingwood, what this process was, Gail, as a government person mm -hmm. with certain technical skills, mm -hmm. had access to other government folks in mm -hmm. other ministries, federally and provincially. We went into the community, mm -hmm. figured out who has a stake in the harbor, mm -hmm. either a property owner or somebody who wants to use the mm -hmm. harbor or somebody has a responsibility for the harbor. Mm -hmm. We created a citizens committee mm -hmm of people who had decision-making authority. We asked them, what's the future that you see for your harbor? What do you want to use your harbor for? It's not up to government folks to tell communities what they want to use their place for. And they decided recreation, business, industry, charter boats, safe enough for body contact, you know, being able to be in the water. And we worked over a process of eight years with them. We, up, we optimized the sewage treatment plant got rid of the algal problem. We cleaned up the contaminated sediment from the shipbuilding industry that shut down in the late 80s but left the contaminants behind. So a partnership between governments, industry, municipalities, we cleaned that up. We got the Conservation Authority to work with the Ministry of Natural Resources to re, re bring the stream back to health because it had been channelized and we put it back in a meandering fashion. We had fish spawning in that stream mm. for the first time in 35 years mm. after we renaturalized mm. the stream because the people in Collingwood wa were proud of their place. Mm -hmm. They were not proud of their harbor. Mm. They were absolutely determined to bring it back to health. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did. And there were, there were at that time 43 other locations mm. in the Great Lakes. Collingwood was the first one to be mm. declared cleaned up mm -hmm. in 1994. Mm -hmm. And it was about 2004 between yeah about 10 years later that the next one mm. would be a success story so it was an absolute success mm. it was extremely ex exciting to have the technical people mm. the investment from the community mm. partners galore every project had maybe 20 or 30 partners chipping in to make it happen because the people there the mayors mm. uh, the council all the in lead industries really believed that bringing back their harbor was good for them, good for their well-being, good for the economy of the region, good for the stigma of Collingwood, so it was, uh, it was fabulous. Now, you mentioned that there's over 40 other areas of challenge on the Great Lakes. Um, obviously, each will have their own peculiar challenges and, and, and needs, but are there any lessons that you drew from Collingwood that that regardless of the situation uh, or, the, or the location around the Great Lakes, w you would apply to those situations as well? I get asked very often, why was Collingwood so successful before any of the other locations? Mm. Uh, it has nothing to do with size. Yeah. Collingwood is a small harbor. There are much smaller locations that are going nowhere. There are some big locations that are doing terrifically. So it's not a question of size. It is leadership, that means the people in the community who mm. have a responsibility there are given a leadership opportunity. Mm -hmm. They are the decision makers. It is not up to government to create a plan and then try and communicate it to the community and say, this is what we think we'll do. It's up to the community to develop their own mm. plan. Then they own it. Mm. So it's leadership, it's ownership, decision making skills, but it's also being able to bring to the table the technical expertise that they may not have. So build their capacity for knowledge, mm -hmm. for decision making, open doors into government opportunities, get them to open doors into the business community, for example. But it really is centralizing the decision making in the place that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the residents, it's the leadership, the mayors, mm -hmm. council, that's really important, the mm -hmm. meat industries, that's really important. And I can give you an example, Hamilton, mm -hmm. 
is one of the largest on the Canadian side of these right. areas. They're called areas of concern. Mm -hmm. And it is a stunning success. Mm -hmm. It is one of the most complex. Mm -hmm. It has the worst sediment contamination mm -hmm. problem in the Canadian side of the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. But the coordinator for the process, mm -hmm. John Hall, gets everyone else to be the lead. Mm -hmm. Gives the credit to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, they've got a huge uh, research facility right mm -hmm. there, so they've got a lot of, of knowledge and capacity. Mm -hmm. um, they've got ownership by the mm -hmm. city. You talk to the city of Hamilton about mm -hmm. the remedial action plan, everyone knows about it. Mm -hmm. You go to a small community and you talk about it, they don't know what you're talking about. So it's that connection, integrating it right into mm -hmm. the heart of, the, of what matters to the municipality. Mm -hmm. That's a really big, mm -hmm. big element, you know, the sense of pride. Right. Now that there's a um, there's a concept in life of, of walking the talk, as it were, and, and your own personal life and your own garden and greenhouse that, that you and your husband have are a, kind of a demonstration of, of your values in life. Tell us a little bit about how this this area developed, because we'll, we'll want to walk around and have a look at some of the, um, the the true splendor of what's here. How long have you been here, and and how long has this taken to to become what it is today? So um, I consider myself wearing green on my sleeve. Mm -hmm. I make it no secret to my students uh, mm -hmm. that there's going to get a big environmental push when it comes to my program, engineering and public policy. There's going to be environment in there. Uh, I've been an ar ardently passionate about the environment since I can remember. Um, and, and that's why it's a thrill to be able to do what I do. This garden is an example of, of diversity. Um, this garden brings in wildlife, birds, butterflies, insects, food. Mm. Um, this garden is now five years old, which mm. will be a bit surprising. Some of it was here to begin with, but we took out a lot of sort of standard grass mm -hmm. and shrubs and diversified it into a perennial gardens, into a greenhouse, into uh, vegetable gardens, herb gardens, uh, and you'll enjoy it as you walk around. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest challenge of, of all of this process, what the, you found personally in, in doing all this? Um, I don't see the garden as a big challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of work. Right. It's very, okay. very physical. Good. Um, the, what, what was interesting was we moved from Scarborough to Mississauga. Right. right. So in the spring uh, in, in Scarborough, we dug up 14 trees, mm -hmm. trucked them over. Wow. I personally dug up 200, 350 pots of perennials. I know because the su summer we got here was bone dry. Right. I would come back from work every day and water the pots. So mm -hmm. uh, to sort of zone out, I would start counting, sort of like a zen to watering, mm -hmm. just counting the pots, mm -hmm. saying hello to everybody. So that was big, getting everything into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, also getting approval to build the greenhouse, was that was a big mm. challenge. Because, Speak to that. that that's, well, yeah. the, the greenhouse is a novel construction. It, right. it was designed by my husband. Mm -hmm. um, it uses Lexan as compared to solar glass. Mm -hmm. So it, uses, it needs a lot, lot less structural members mm -hmm. in order to make it stable. Mm -hmm. And we sent the drawings to the city for permit approval. They'd never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. It is quite innovative. And um, we sent them the drawings in May, thinking we would get the greenhouse built in June. We finally, after drawing, after drawing, after drawing, to finally convince them that it was sound, mm -hmm. we got approval to build it late August, uh, got it closed up late October, and brought in all the plants that we had from our pre previous greenhouse mm -hmm. that were sitting out here in the lawn that day, and I kid you not, that night we had the first killing frost. My. And I will never forget that. So it was, quite a, it was quite a challenge to get it approved, and it's going to last for 50 years. It's, wow. it's indestructible. Isn't that wonderful. Tell us about some of the projects you're working on right now. What, what's, what's, what's on Gail Kranzberg's agenda these days? Uh, well, aside from my photography, which is a photographic uh, record of the evolution of the gardens. Right. So I'm going to do a, a few books on those. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm in the process of de developing with a team of, of colleagues in Canada and the United States a Great Lakes future scenario right. program. So we're going to figure out what might drive the, fu the future mm -hmm. of the Great Lakes. Economy, right. mm -hmm. energy, climate change, mm -hmm. invasive species, what, what, what possibly mm -hmm. could do? We're going to get a bunch of students to work on that. Right. We're going to get together and, and start developing scenarios mm. 
uh, and, and typically in the scenario you'd have two axes, let's say, let's say bad economy, good economy, bad environment, good environment. Right. This is where you want to be, good mm -hmm. environment, good economy. So what right. does that look like? Right. So you, you, you tell a story about mm -hmm. where you prefer to be. Mm -hmm. Then you look at what might get you there. Right. Then you say, well, how are things actually going? Mm. And if they're going somewhere else, what can we do mm. as scientists and policy analysts mm -hmm. to help governments and businesses get us to the right. happy place? Right. So I'm very excited about that because sure. it's really, it's going to be a, a very inclusive strategy mm -hmm. for the future of the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. It's going to include uh, not just academics, but in government folks from both sides mm -hmm. of the border, all the Great Lakes states in Ontario, wow. Quebec, mm -hmm. uh, universities, students, colleges. Mm -hmm. Seneca College is the first yes. college on board, so right. we're very excited about that. And we're excited too. Yeah, <laughs> so that, that's going to be, so that's getting started this September and it'll go nice. for about a year and a half. Right. Now, uh, uh, just uh, in the interest of, of the work that we're doing with, with Gail, Seneca and McMaster also work on the Regeneration Institute for the Great Lakes and there's some projects that we're working on there as well. Maybe you could just give a little bit of an overview of some of that. Sure. Well, the Regeneration Institute for the Great Lakes is all about um, training people on the ground, be they developers, community members, businesses, governments, local communities, on how to make their place superior. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond sustaining where you are. Right. which is hard enough as, mm -hmm. we gr as populations mm -hmm. grow, but actually bringing back right. excellence to mm -hmm. a city. And we're now embarking on a training program. Mm -hmm. uh, we're developing some training manuals and curriculum to host, host some workshops in the fall for the development community mm -hmm. uh, in Hamilton to talk about livable cities, mm -hmm. um, how to navigate approvals, mm -hmm. uh, given how complicated bylaws might be in a community, uh, how to bring back natural assets, like mm -hmm. maybe a buried stream that you could right. daylight. So we're training um, not just how to make a green building even greener, but how mm -hmm. to connect the space between the buildings right. and make, make places livable and sustainable cumulatively. I'm really excited about this because Hamilton is a really mm -hmm. great case study. It's mm -hmm. a city that could be a city in transition right. from somewhat difficult downtown to mm -hmm. a revitalized core that could be a model for all the cities mm -hmm. around the Great Lakes and cumulatively that's what's going to make the Great Lakes come back to life. What a wonderful overview of a, a tremendous variety of, of, of initiatives and, and academic work and practical and just at a personal level the, the gardens that you've, you've developed here. I want to thank you uh, Dr. Gail Kranzberg for being with us and it's let's, been a real pleasure. Let's take an opportunity to see the gardens as well. Thank Come you very much. Down. Great. <laughs>